So uh, my name's Lucy, I'm a UX designer at EF. Anybody heard of EF, Education First? Yeah, a few hands up, that's good. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how I am very often lost in translation um, and share with you six lessons uh, from designing for international users. So I will get started. Hopefully. Okay, great. So really quick introduction uh, for those of you that don't know EF. Uh, so um, they are, I think, the largest private education company, uh, founded in 1965 by a very young Bertel Holt, who, based on his own experiences, wanted young people to have the opportunity to travel from Sweden um, and, and learn, uh, learn a language whilst they experience the culture. So over 50 years on, and EF do a variety of things from language training, cultural exchanges, lots of uh, travel uh, and tours uh, all over the world. So hopefully that gives you a bit of context as to what I mean by uh, designing for international users at EF. So there are many challenges with doing uh, designing for users all over the world, one of which is obviously they are a lot harder to reach um, and it's not always as easy to just fly somewhere and do research with people. Um, it's, it's a bit tricky logistically uh, and um, time and money. I have a confession to make. I am probably one of few people in my office that only speaks my native language, uh, apart from maybe a little bit of French. Um, and so obviously not all our users are speaking English. So again, that's another massive challenge. It goes without saying that all our users all over the world have different cultures and traditions, different belief systems. Even the way we market to them is very differently. So all of these varying factors mean that actually running and designing for these users can require a lot more time. It can be a lot more expensive. So one of the things I want to talk to you about today when I share my lessons is a redesign project I did at EF, which was uh, redesigning the marketing sites for EF English Live. Uh, EF English Live is an online English school, uh, so, uh, and we target mainly young professionals that want to learn English to boost their career. Um, and so this is users all over the world that can come and do this. And we have a combination of live lessons with uh, native teachers and an online learning platform. So the redesign of this marketing site had to work uh, in at least 22 different countries and in 15 different languages. Um, it gets more complicated because you think, oh, well, we can, we can use the same site and get things translated. But actually, obviously, the users have varying needs, but also the business has massive different needs. So for each of these countries, we have different marketing managers. And so there are many different business objectives, which makes things a whole lot more complicated. So this brings me on to my first lesson, um, which is really about understanding every one of those markets. Um, so as part of doing that initial research and working with stakeholders, really try and understand what are the market uh, objectives. So what are the strategies uh, and the goals and trends? So as I said earlier, the way in which we market even to our users is very, very different. Um, and the way that we design for them, uh, what, what's trending, what are the competitors doing, it varies massively. Um, even so in some of our markets like Mexico and Latin America, we do a lot of fun, humorous TV advertising. That's a core part of our marketing. Um, but for our other audiences in Europe, such as Germany, that just doesn't translate, that doesn't work as effectively. So understanding that uh, is really crucial. So as I said, thinking about the strategies and thinking about understanding what their targets are, um, what are the KPIs, um, who are they up against. So it's not only our users that are uh, all over the world, our marketing teams are as well. Um, and so really using our local experts to understand their competitors and the trends is, is really valuable. But also thinking about the yearly plan, um, I think it was very easy early on to just think about the now when we started designing things. But actually when we got talking with the marketing managers, understanding that their plans and the way that they market the product is going to change almost on a monthly basis. They're going to be trialing different offers, trialing different pricing models, and you really need to know that up front. So, brings me on to my second lesson, and everyone's going to roll their eyes and think, oh no, surveys are so boring. Um, but as I said, uh, these users and my colleagues, uh, the stakeholders, are very hard to reach. 
And so, you know, running stakeholder workshops, focus groups, getting everybody in isn't always possible. Um, and so we've had to find ways around getting that input, getting that insight from people. So first up, surveys uh, from the stakeholders. Um, so as I said, it was a really great way to, to get some input when people are on different time zones, I can't always get them on the phone. So we set up a survey um, asking the teams to evaluate the website, what did they think was currently working well, give us a bit of background of trends, competitors, um, and we got some really great insights. The only downside is, is that everybody's very busy, so you do have to sort of you know, push them, nod them into give, giving you the input. But overall, you get some really helpful insights. They're relatively easy to set up, and it makes everybody feel um, involved in the project as well. So from the user's perspective, uh, we also do a lot of surveys or short polls. Um, and so we did this as part of the redesign. We did this on our old site. We'd set up quick polls on specific pages in the site just to understand what was missing, uh, what were they looking for, were there any questions that were unanswered. Again, the, 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 the joy of this is that they are really easy to set up and it removes the language barrier. Um, so what I did is work with colleagues to get this, these short polls translated uh, so we can get them up on the site and target the users from each of our countries. So the trick with these is keeping them really short. Uh, I think we found that sometimes we try and ask too many questions on the site uh, and, and typically we'd say no more than three. Uh, people just lose a bit of interest. Um, keep them very targeted as well. Um, so we'd often target specific pages such as the pricing page, for example, uh, just to see you know, is there any other inf information you're looking for here to help you buy today, things like that. Keeping them very open because you know, closed responses aren't gonna really be very helpful, yes or no answers. Um, so really looking for the detail. And then thinking about that timing and placement. As I said, people arriving on the site, it's no good just popping up a survey straight away. So giving them a bit of a time to explore um, and, and digest the information. So my next lesson, in the absence of having users around you all of the time, data is really powerful. And I know um, we've already uh, had a talk that was all about the data. But some of the tools that we use um, and I use are analytics, heat maps, and session recordings. So very simply, from a very simple point of view, just looking at the uh, the analytics can really give us the how. How are users currently behaving? How are they using our site? And it can start, uh, help us start to identify where there are current gaps or current problems that we can later explore in qualitative research. So some of the things we can do is obviously segment by markets. We can really break down those things by country. And what we do see is that there are variances, uh, particularly in mobile device use. Uh, some of our markets, mobile users, visitors, will be as little as sort of 30%, whereas it can go up to, say, 50 and 60% in markets such as Taiwan, Japan. We can also look at user flows. So what we did with the, with the old site was really look at how people were currently navigating through our website. Um, and it really highlighted where we thought we had some great information on all these How It Works pages, and nobody was looking at any of them. They were just going to one of them, obviously not finding what they were looking for and continuing. So it really helped, helped us to identify those gaps that we could explore a little bit further. And so this is where we can look at things like heat maps as well. Um, and we do these on a regular basis um, whenever we make any changes or updates. Um, and they're great because you can look at all devices. Again, they're segmented by market. Um, so it really gives you a quick and simple overview of what's being missed. And session recordings as well. Um, so I should say that the platform that we use is Hotjar. Um, there are obviously other platforms out there as well. And Hotjar we use for our surveys, polls, um, heat maps, and these session recordings. Um, and this is a great way to observe real users. So whilst we're not able to um, ask questions, we can, we can sit down, review, and see how people are using the site. Again, we can look at all devices and segment by market. The only downside to these is, say, it just takes a little bit more time to review and go through them all. But they can be really beneficial. So how do we recruit our users? Um, again, lesson four is our, our, the website has become a very variable recruitment tool for us. Um, 
and li like the other tools it's very easy to set up so we will set up a little pop-up advertisement on our website um, normally we'll just have a brief explanation um, about what the requirements are and then once people have signed up if they're interested we then email them and do more of a thorough sort of screener with them there the benefits of this are it's relatively low cost so there's no um, recruitment fees or finders fees we know that we're targeting people that are interested in our product. Uh, they're coming, coming to our websites. So they're obviously interested in learning English. They're our target user group. Um, and as I said, they're very easy to set up. I think the only thing, again, is that what we have to do is get things translated. Um, so I'll work with colleagues to do that. So it's a little bit more admin heavy um, going back and forward. Um, but as I said, it's a really great way to get your target user group. Um, so I should say that a lot of our user research is obviously done remotely. Um, so when we recruit via the website, uh, we do a lot of uh, sessions via Skype, screen sharing. Um, however, mobile is a little bit more tricky um, because the screen sharing software is not quite there yet. There are new tools out there such as Lookback. But the challenge with that is that a lot of the onboarding is in English. Um, and of course, for us, we want to talk to people that are learning English. And so that's not very helpful for us right now. So what we do do is have a sort of blend of, um, we do a lot of uh, remote screen sharing research for desktops. And then we do a lot more guerrilla research uh, on the mobile. And for that, we're very lucky. We're in a very international city. Um, so we can use colleagues. We can use social media uh, to reach out to people. We can get them to come into the office. EF also has a few schools in London. So quite often, we'll go into the schools um, and work with students that way as well. So my next lesson is, of course, we've got our users. We need to run the research sessions. How do we do that when I only speak English? <laughs> huge, huge challenge. Um, and so um, what I've been doing is actually working with, with colleagues, with the stakeholders, the marketing managers, to run these interview sessions. Um, so obviously, the benefit of this is that our users can talk in their native language. Um, of course, we, we also test with and run research with students that are more advanced in English, but a lot of the time we're talking to people that are on their journey, uh, so they could be varying levels of proficiency. And what we found is when we've talked to more advanced students in English is that they've actually been restrained by their level of language, so they can't fully uh, communicate and uh, their problems, what they're experiencing. They're, they're limited. So it's much nicer and they feel much more relaxed if they can speak in their native language. We get much more honest and detailed feedback. Of course, by working with um, the colleagues uh, and marketing managers, they get to really see the benefit of running the research for themselves. Um, they become champions of UX internally. Um, so from running sessions very early on, uh, from joining, um, later on I would get them coming back to me and say, can we do another round of research? You know, we want to just see how this is working. So it's really good, really invaluable. But of course, it comes with some big challenges um, because they are not researchers. Um, so it takes a lot of practice and a lot of understanding of the sort of do's and don'ts and trying to run a, uh, a successful interview. From my point of view, it's challenging because sometimes there's a lack of control, as in I don't always, I can't always sort of intervene or stop or perhaps get them to pause. Um, so in that, in that instance as well, it takes a lot of practice and understanding. And I now have a few colleagues that I do this with on a regular basis, um, so they understand what works. And the sessions are a little bit longer because of it. Um, there's a lot more sort of translating between us and, and taking moments to digest what's happened. So if you're planning on working with um, internal colleagues, running interviews, I have some tips. Um, so obviously, plan and practice together. Um, you'd always do a practice uh, dummy interview session. Um, but I think take the time to do that more, run through the research plan, and give a very sort of clear script so that they don't stray too far away from that or ask any questions outside of it. Break the sessions down into sections so that you can, between you, the two of you, you can have a catch up about what's just happened. And then from my point of view, I can say, right, well, I observed this. Um, can you maybe probe a bit more about that? 
I think some, I've become much more observational, but it's amazing what you can still see and understand from watching where users go and where they're not going. And so by breaking it down into manageable sections, you're able to do more retrospective probing. So at the end of a, of a specific task, we can have a little catch up and then maybe go back and ask about why some things happened. And of course, we always record everything, but I think it's more, much more important in this instance because what you find is you're both taking notes. Um, and so, um, yeah, you definitely need to listen back afterwards because things will be missed. So, on to my last lesson, um, is to make sure you design and test in all markets. So, I should say that this, this marketing site, as I said, had to work for, in 15 different languages, 22 countries. Um, but we didn't launch all of these at one time. We had a very staged rollout plan. So, we actually launched Italy first. Um, but at the same time, we had to still make sure we gathered all the requirements. For, for as much as possible for all our users for all the markets but what we have done is since Italy is we've basically been launching in each market and doing a round of user research in each one and this is invariable because there are many many differences um, as simple as the style sheet and uh, typography can vary massively um, alignment uh, in Arabic it just, if from a designer's perspective, everything's going to break. <laughs> uh, so it's really important you test that. I have a few examples here of just of how things, how much the language will vary and change your design for your users. And forms as well. I think forms, uh, I think. One of the things I had to accept very early on is obviously forms, we like as, as few fields as possible. Um, from the marketing objective side, nope. <laughs> there are a set number of fields we need to meet our systems, such as the Salesforce systems and things like that. And these also vary by market as well. Um, for example, in Mexico, uh, we have to capture a lot more, more information to make sure that we get the right phone number uh, and the right state. So common localizations we've, we've found from testing each market are the style sheet, style sheet changes, without a doubt. Um, local imagery, um, we tried to keep on top of this as best as we could, um, but we did find that a few images snuck through and our users struggled to self-identify. Uh, so Western images creeping in um, for our um, Asian and Middle East markets. Um, that was really important for our users. Um, copy, and by copy I also mean um, not just CTAs and translating, but also our whole content strategy. The way that we communicate and market our product is very different in some countries than others. For instance, in Japan and Taiwan, um, the concept of group classes uh, online is very new. Um, and, so, and also there's this um, nervousness about coming forwards and talking in a group of people you don't know. Um, whereas in Europe, they're a lot more, they generally a lot more confident and they also understand the concept. A lot of the competitors are doing that as well. So the way we talk about our product has to vary massively. And I've already mentioned about the forms and the differences uh, there. So some top tips. I've definitely found that Arabic, um, Chinese and Japanese um, definitely require their own style sheets. Often the font size has to increase. What we found is, um, for example, in navigation, using uppercase navigation, I think for our um, uh, Latin markets was, let's say, 12 pixels uppercase. So we just copied that across. And so in Taiwan, we had 12 pixel. And then in testing, the, we understood that the legibility wasn't good enough. So that had to be up to 16 pixels. Just small little increments like that. Always test in the shortest and longest, longest languages. And I think this is probably more from, a, from, from the designer's perspective, um, just to save you a lot of upset later on down the line. <laughs> things, things will definitely break. CTAs, for example, how I long for a CTA that just says sign up, <laughs> two little words, that just never happens. So um, understanding that early on uh, with real content is really important. Working with local copywriters, um, was really important as well. I think we'd used just, um, people to just translate the content and that wasn't effective enough. We needed to really talk in the tone of voice that would work for our users. 
are going to accept in things that will break because they will and because of that you just need to allow a lot more time for design. So that's my six lessons. Uh, make sure you understand all markets. Uh, it's not as simple as one business model for all. Quite often there will be differences. Use the power of surveys and data uh, when your users are not always easily accessible to you. Recruit via the website. Um, use colleagues, uh, but with caution. It takes a lot of time and practice. And make sure you always design and test in, in every market that you roll out. That's me. <laughs> Thanks.